tell us about yourself. Uh, my name is Joelle Pinot, and I'm a faculty member here at McGill University in the School of Computer Science. Tell me about your journey through academia and STEM. How did your interest in STEM develop? Um, I guess I was always interested in uh, science and math growing up, going through high school, particular uh, mathematics, but um, I wanted to explore the more applied side of things. Uh, so I started my university degree um, at the University of Waterloo um, in an engineering program. Um, I was looking at systems design engineering, and towards the end of that, I got involved in a research project on robotics. So we were building a six-legged robot that was supposed to move around. I was building the sonar system that the robot used to detect obstacles, and I was quite fascinated by this project. So then I started um, looking at grad school, and I applied for a PhD program in robotics at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. Um, I started in that program not wanting to do a PhD, but they were only offering a PhD program, but I knew if after about two years I quit the program, I would get a master's as a consolation prize, and so that was kind of my, pro my plan going into the program. Um, and of course, after two years, I was just more fascinated with robotics than before, and so I decided to continue, complete the PhD, and at the end of that, I applied for faculty positions, and that's how I find myself here at McGill. Awesome. Um, so what were some difficulties you have faced along the way? Um, <laughs> from day one, right? I started in this engineering program. I was coming from a background um, where I had done a lot of basic science and uh, mathematics, but you know, first semester I have this computer programming course, and I have to say, you know, the prof's first question walking in was, "How many programming languages do you know?" And most of my classmates knew one, two, three, up to seven programming languages, and I didn't know any. Um, I could use word processing. That was it. Um, so that was a really rough. Uh, transition. I almost quit my engineering degree after the first couple of weeks, um, thinking I couldn't do this. Um, but I had a couple good friends who convinced me to stick around for a few more months, um, and I finally figured it out. Um, but that was a bit rough. Uh, have, were there any instances you feel that you were treated differently because you were a woman? Mm, I, I would have to say, in a lot of cases, um, it's hard to know, right? And it can be both positive and negative. It's, it's hard to know whether the reason you are selected to give a talk at a particular event is because they decided they needed a woman on their lineup and therefore they invited you. Um, or is it um, that you have been left off of a collaboration because people were less comfortable with you as a woman or didn't think about you? In many cases, I you just don't know, and so I tend to just kind of forge along and do the things that I'm interested in doing and not uh, worry about it too much. What are some positive experiences you've had as a woman in STEM? Um, I've had a lot of positive experiences in the career in STEM. Right? I don't know how much of that is attributed to me being a woman or not. I would have to say it's a field that I love. I work in artificial intelligence in machine learning and robotics. Um, I get to work with young students who are super creative, um, and um, we get to essentially pick the research projects we want to do. We have a ton of freedom, so as a, as a career, as a professional experience, it's a fantastic, fantastic field. Have you seen much improvement for women in STEM in the last 10 years? Um, I, I th this, in many ways, the situation is pretty stable in computer science. Um, we still have a lot of challenges. If I look at you know how many female faculty members do we have, still about the same as when I was hired 12 years ago. If I look at the number of female PhD students we have in our program, it's pretty constant at about 10, 15 percent. Um, one place where we have seen definite changes in the number of um, young women we have in our entry-level courses in computer science. Um, so we have a first-year uh, first course, Comp 202, which is kind of the gateway into computer science. For some people, it's the only course they will take, and for other people, it will be a first of a few. Um, 
And uh, in recent years, the number of women in that course has dramatically uh, increased to the point that um, a year ago we had about 50% uh, women representation in that entry level course. Do they then go on to take more courses? Um, I think some of them do. Um, we have a lot of young women who choose the joint computer science degrees. It's computer science and biology, CS and math, um, and I think for many of them, including myself, you don't go into university thinking you're going to study computer science, um, but if it's the kind of program where there are many entry points, people can decide many point along their studies to um, study this field, then it reaches a much more diverse set of people. What are some specific things that you feel still need improvement for women in STEM? Just having more diversity at all levels of the pipeline, right? In many cases, at least for me, I was reasonably fortunate. I didn't feel like there were strong barriers along the way. I felt there was many more people who um, wanted to be supportive of uh, my career, help me be successful. Um, but to this day, I sit in meetings and there's 12 of us around the table and I'm on the only woman around the table. And um, that happened my first scientific workshop where I presented. There was 10 or 15 presenters. I was the only woman. Uh, that was back in the early 2000s. Um, and so it's just uh, finding a way, I think, to increase, the, to make this field appealing to more young women such that they decide to pursue that path. How do you maintain a healthy balance between career and family? Hmm. <laughs> uh, so I have four children, and so that means that I don't have a choice but to maintain a healthy balance. Um, you know, for me, from the beginning, um, I was always someone who s kept space in my schedule for things that I liked to do. Um, while I was in university, in undergrad, I would play in a local orchestra for some time, and when I, at some point I took an interest into taking dance classes, so I would do that twice a week. So I always saved these spaces in my schedule. Um, and when I had children, um, then I saved space for my family and my schedule also. And so pretty early on, kind of put in a system in place where I was not working on evenings when I was with them, and I wasn't working on weekends. Um, and so that means sometimes that I work late in the evening once they go to bed, um, but I still have time with them and we take family vacation and so on and, um, and uh, I enjoy time with them and I feel that that's helpful for me. Um, it also I think makes me more efficient. I've optimized a lot of things about how I do the job such that in f it fits in the number of hours that I'm willing to spend on the job. Have you had any mentors in the course of your career? And if so, can you tell us about them? I had uh, many mentors along the way, um, both men and women. Um, I would say the ones that had the most impact are probably the mentors that I had during my academic career. Um, earlier on when you're going through school, whether you're doing an undergrad degree or so on, it's pretty structured. And so it's a little bit more obvious what you need to do and you can sort of get feedback from your peers about how well you're doing once you launch into a faculty career. For me, there was a huge space of things that I could do when making good choices about um, which project should I be taking on, um, how to deal with sometimes difficult situations with my graduate students and so on. So I have a set of colleagues in my department that I consider to be mentors um, that have been there from when I joined McGill. There's um, two or three of them on whose door I knock on regularly um, and just drop in. We you know, have a cup of tea <laughs> and then brainstorm about um, how to manage different aspects of our lives. And as I've become a little bit more senior, they've become more um, conversations uh, between peers. Um, but that has made um, the journey much more feasible. Why is it important to have diversity? Um, so I, I work in um, artificial intelligence, machine learning. In, in many ways, um, 
there's going to be major changes in our society that are going to be brought through by new technologies in AI. Um, and f from my point of view, it's really important to get a diverse set of individuals building these artificial intelligence. If we don't, if we have a very narrow set of people designing the AI, then the AI is going to behave in a way that reflects the, the values of the minority set. Um, when you build an AI system, I'm going to get a little technical here, but when you build an AI system, you have, the, the computer does a lot of the thinking, right? But you have, as a designer, to specify what we call the, the value function, right? What is it that they're trying to solve? If you build a computer system to play chess, they're trying to win the game. And for some simple tasks, specifying that objective is easy. When we build an AI system that is maybe a companion to live with the elderly, we have to specify that reward function, that objective. Um, and if we do that from a very narrow perspective, then we're going to get AIs that behave in a very narrow way. And uh, so as much as I don't think we need to you know, force everyone into field of studies they don't want to study, I fundamentally believe it really important for us to make sure that the people that are trained to design this new technology come from a really wide, diverse set of um, e life experiences, backgrounds. Um, could you give us a summary of the kind of research your lab does? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm a co-director of the Reasoning and Learning Lab. Um, it's a rather large lab. Uh, there's four faculty members working together, and we have about 60 graduate students all together. Um, within the scope of the lab, um, we have some activities in what I would say is more fundamental research, where we develop new uh, mathematical model and algorithms for um, building intelligent systems. And then we have several um, application areas where we look at how these algorithms, these models, can be used to solve important problems. One of these areas is um, a treatment design for chronic disease. So we're looking at, can we use AI system to improve, for example, um, an artificial pancreas system that's designed for people with diabetes um, and that can, in real time, deliver an amount of insulin that's personalized to each individual's metabolism um, and situation. Um, and so we do several of these applications um, on medical treatment design, usually in partnership with uh, clinical researchers at McGill University and elsewhere. We also have a branch of application where we are looking at use of uh, AI technology for um, conversational agents, chatbot systems, and so on, so that humans can have conversation with um, agents but where the agent replies using natural language, um, adapting conversation style to the person it's talking to, and so on. Um, and then we do work in robotics also. We have a few robot systems. In particular, we specialize in uh, robotic wheelchairs. So we have a few prototypes that we've built over the years um, that we are um, testing on a regular basis with people with physical mobility disorders. Um, including taking out the chair for doing field trials in local shopping centers and museums and things like that. What is one piece of advice you have for a woman or girl trying to pursue a career in STEM? Hmm. Um, so, I mean, there's the classic, right? You know, f follow the things that you're passionate about. You know, take on the things that you're interested in doing. Um, but then it's also, I would add to that, um, to not be afraid to do things that you might not be good at. To not necessarily only take on the challenges that you know you can achieve, but to really take on challenges where you might fail and might discover in the process something about yourself, something about the problem you're trying to solve. Um, I would also suggest to um, Pick places where you, or teams, where you think you're going to be successful. Teams, you know, it's not because you are admitted into lots of top universities that all of them are places where you're going to find the, um, the environment you need to be happy and successful. So choose that wisely. 
what advice do you have for someone who is interested in computer science? Um, I think it's a great field. There's so many interesting problems. Um, the impact of computer science goes far beyond just you know writing computer programs and building machines. Computer science is going to impact um, how we uh, go forward in terms of uh, solving problems with respect to our societies, with respect to the environment, with respect to healthcare, education. All these fields are going to change drastically using solutions from computer science in the next decades. Um, and so by entering the field of computer science, you're developing, acquiring a set of tools, knowledge that you can then take out and solve problems in all these other areas. 